Okay, so uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, we are uh, Daniel and Etienne uh, from um, uh, from uh, Faber Novel Technologies, and today we will be talking about making event sourcing code composable using monads or uh, using a functional structure. Yeah. Uh, so we are both technical leads at Zangularity, which uh, has recently joined the Faber Novel uh, Group under a new brand, Faber Novel Technologies. Uh, so there's also Applidium, uh, which is another entity of a group, which will be joining us in this, in this new brand. Uh, so we keep making applications and platforms, while uh, Applidium specializes in mobile apps, AI and chatbots, while uh, the Faber Novel Group itself is known for its uh, exper expertise in uh, innovative business, business transformations. So uh, it's really good news for us because we perfectly uh, complete each other. Uh, now at Applidium and Zangularity together, we'll, we are uh, 150 persons and we'll be looking to, to hire 100 more people uh, over the next year. Yeah. So uh, today we won't be boring you uh, with the actual story behind it. But uh, just know that many of the, many of the patterns uh, you will see today are actually used on major projection systems uh, in our firm. So what's the plan for today? Um, in the first part, we'll define basic building blocks for event sourcing, and we'll see that an imperative approach to event sourcing has severe limitations in terms of composability. Then in the second part, we'll explore how functional programming principles can help us overcome these composability problems. But first, uh, let's start with, with a quick introduction to event sourcing. So, uh, the idea behind event sourcing for those who, who never did it is actually very simple. Instead of uh, storing the actual state, the current state of a system, we'll just be storing changes to that state. So, basically, we'll be reifying uh, any modification of, of the system uh, in the form of events, and then we'll be storing those events in some journal, I sometimes call a store, uh, or a log, and then when we, when we want to know what the current state of the system is, we just need to replay those events to compute a new state. And usually the code which, which does it is called an even handler. So why, why bother? Uh, oh, and just one more thing. Obviously, uh, when we have a state, well, we can use it to derive and produce new events which will be uh, re-inject into, into the log, either in response to external signals or uh, in response to some internal logic. So, why should we bother? Well, uh, using event sourcing has several interesting properties. For example, uh, as all the changes are reified and we, we remember them all, and then we can easily make a partial replay so that we know uh, all the states, uh, all, all the previous states of the system as well. So we have audits for free. Another, um, another advantage is uh, that we can introduce other event handlers, even post hoc on like Two, two years worth of production events uh, to compute new interesting things uh, which we didn't think about in the first place. And then uh, it's, it's very, well, it's not very easy, but it's much easier to integrate distributed systems when they are even sourced because we can reason about, about causality uh, and, we can, uh, and we can much more easily achieve reactive architectures. Uh, so, just to clarify a thing, uh, what we want, there are some things we won't be speaking today, and we won't be speaking about any particular event sourcing framework, nor we'll be speaking about uh, any infrastructure concerns or architecture or error handling. Okay, so the, the theme of this track is type and functional programming, so we'll be focusing on two things, composability and uh, the model and the API developers use when, when, when doing event sourcing. Okay, so uh, before we go any further, let's start by defining some basic building blocks for event sourcing. Okay, so uh, we'll start with a domain I suppose many of you uh, already used, uh, at least when you're starting uh, learning to program, it's the total. So uh, we'll define some total which have an idea and um, a position which can be moved and an absolute direction, which can be rotated. Um, okay, so let's create a command for this, um, this turtle. So a turtle can be created, it can be turned, and it can uh, work straight on. Um, this command can have some validation. So they return 
uh, they can return an error or the new states. Uh, for instance, for the, cre for the uh, creation, uh, we just check if that the position is not too far away. Uh, if you look at the signature, you will see that we use currying because it allows us to create some uh, already per, um, configured uh, command that we can use and uh, it will be uh, more nice uh, later. So let's look at a simple program uses, using this model. So we, we start by creating um, just a function which uh, make two, which call two commands, so it's um, work then in turn. Then we use it along with other uh, standard commands. And we can just uh, test the, um, the state. So if you look at this code, there is some slight problem in it. There is some duplication. We have to pass the state from step to step. So we can mitigate this problem for now by using flat map. OK, problem solved. Well, not really, but. Uh, OK, so we have a model. We have a total. We can do something with them. And um, now, how can we uh, add the event sourcing stuff with this? So let's start by creating some events. So um, we will create one event per command. Our events contain the ID of the total. It's not the best way to do this. Uh, usually, we will wrap the event with some metadata, but for, for now, it will be good uh, for this talk. We will keep uh, simple. So let's define uh, an event handler. An event handler is just a function we can use to fold um, uh, on a sequence of events. So if you look at the signature, we take an option of state because a state cannot be uh, defined yet. And it has to return an option, but we know that we will return uh, an actual state. So let's just return a sum, because a sum is an option. For the definition of the handler, um, we will uh, we'll take out the, uh, all the cases. So if you, if you have no state on a creation event, you can create a total. If you have a state on a turn event, you can make the total turn. And of course, if you, have in, if you are in an invalidated transition, uh, we return an error. So for now, it will be just um, an exception because it's more simple, but in real life application, we can do better. Okay, uh, how to use it? We have an initial state, so a none for now. And we have some events, and we, uh, we fold on events using the under that we define to get the final states, and then we can uh, test it or use it. So just note, we use the sum.value uh, method and not the option.get that you should never use. So in this code, there are some border plates. It's not a big deal, but we can do better. So you have to wrap everything in some, and you have to deal with the error by yourself. We can easily do um, a factory for this event handler, which, can, uh, which will receive the partial function and uh, will return a state, not a standard state. So it will um, try the, if the transition is valid. Uh, if it's valid, it will wrap in the sum, and if not, it will uh, uh, return the, the an error. So the new definition is more simpler, much easy to read, and we won't change it uh, from now on, from now on because it's uh, uh, good for for what we want to do. Okay, so we we have an event handler. Uh, now we have to update our commands. So now. Our commands uh, are still the same, but they will return an event, not the, uh, not the actual state. Uh, we, could see we could see this like an indirection uh, from the previous code. Instead of uh, returning the new state, we return uh, an event that you can use to uh, find the new state. So, OK, we can <coughs> generate events. We can uh, use them to generate a new state, but we have to store the event somewhere uh, in order to uh, 
be able to retrieve them uh, later. So let's start with a journal. We can persist one event and a hydro table, which uh, will fetch the events and return a new state for us by using the, uh, the event handler. And we'll um, uh, suppose we have an implementation for those from the, for the total. So here is a simple uh, example code. We use the create uh, command to get the creation event. We persist it, and then later we will be able to hydrate it and to test it. But of course, this code doesn't compile because we are mixing future on either. So thanks to uh, externalities like um, CATS or Scala Z, we can uh, just add some um, some monad transformer or some uh, helpers that uh, they gave to us. So this code is a bit more verbose, but uh, still it's, uh, it does the same thing and it's, uh, it's worked, so it's nice. Okay, so what have we got? Um, we just uh, create a model that we can use. We define some events on an event handler and we can persist these events and uh, replay to get the states later. Yeah. So, uh, is there anything more we, we might want? Uh, well, there is actually one thing I, I want, and it's composability. Um, there are two units of composition uh, we can consider when, when thinking about event sourcing, right? Uh, these are event handlers and the comments that create at the events in the first place. Composing event handlers is really simple because, well, they are just plain functions. Uh, so you can see, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in libraries like Redux or, all, or others, uh, that it's really easy to compose event handlers or reducers, as they are called sometimes. Uh, composing comments, however, is less trivial because it raises the question: uh, What kind of events uh, should we should we use? Okay. Uh, so why, why would we want to compose commands in the first place? Well, remember this one from the basic model? Uh, well, it, we can actually co consider it as a composite command, right? Because we, we delegate to the, to, to, to the walk command and to the turn command to define something which is called walk write. So how could we even source such a thing? There are actually two approaches. Oh, before that, we can have other examples, right? Like turn around, make you turn, and so on. We can really think of a lot of composite comments. And the first approach would be to, to actually define as many kinds of events as we have, as we have comments, right? So, okay, we introduce walk right, which just, it just gives us a walked right event. Where's the problem? Well, it's not extensible. Let us see why. Imagine you, uh, you define another handler uh, than the one we saw before. This handler computes the total distance a turtle has, uh, has, uh, has traveled, okay? Uh, so what happens when we define new kinds of events? Well, every time we define a new kind of event which has anything to do with distance, well, it's, it forces us to update this handler to, to handle all the new cases, right? So imagine that if you have a lot of handlers and a lot of types of events, uh, well, it, it, uh, it, it quickly leads you um, uh, to a system where overlapping even semantics uh, uh, are really hard to reason about. Uh, you can try to, um, to introduce some weird even interactions uh, hierarchies, uh, but it's much simpler to just, just use composition. So the other approach um, is actually to just define a small set of, uh, of basic atomic events, and then just consider that any composed commands well, just emit a composition of those basic events. Uh, that's what, what we would have done with, if we didn't have any event sourcing in the first place. So what should it be any different now? Uh, so if you still don't buy it, let me give you a real life example. Uh, consider we have an application which allows us to take uh, appointments, for example, if we fire a doctor. Uh, we uh, may be able to send messages to each other, and every time we post a message, or well, there is a message posted event which gets, which gets dispatched, uh, and some, somewhere uh, they update a chat-like view so that we, we, we see the new messages. Now imagine that later on we introduce a new feature, 
uh, users can now cancel the meeting because something happened, uh, and they can still uh, optionally post a message to say they're sorry. And there are some constraints we'd like to, to have uh, respected. Obviously, we don't want to deliver the message if the cancellation is not persisted because we, want, we don't want to confuse our users. But we also want to have some atomicity. We don't want to, to, uh, to lose the message uh, in any case. And also, for some reason, for some, we, we, we'd like to avoid having to update the, the chat handlers and perhaps all other kinds of handlers we have across the application. So a simple solution is just to have a cancel appointment comment, which will always emit an appointment canceled event. And sometimes, if the message is actually included, we also emit a message posted event. Uh, yeah. so, um, so let's see how we could emit multiple events from, from our code before, right? So we, we'll take again the, the small walk right function we had. Uh, and obviously now uh, we won't be dealing with state. We won't be dealing with, we will be dealing with the events each of these commands emitted. And well, we need a state here, right? So that we can call the actual second command and the, uh, the simplest way to do it is just use the handler we defined before uh, to reply in memory uh, the, the, the first ongoing event so that we have an intermediate state. We can pass this state along to the second command. So it's important to know that this state only exists in memory, right? It hasn't been persisted. Uh, we only need it because we, well, we want to compute the next event. Uh, the other thing is that we obviously need to return something from, the, from this function and we don't have much choice here. The only thing we can reasonably uh, uh, return is a sequence of events. So obviously for this to work, uh, we need to have a way to persist multiple events in an atomic way. Uh, it's not that hard uh, in this talk. All we have to do is uh, modify the signature of, uh, of, our, of our tray uh, so that it uh, accepts a sequence of events. Uh, but, well, obviously, any implementation uh, would have to, to be able to persist those events atomically. Uh, so if this constraint seems really far-fetched for you, uh, well, we just know that we are not the only ones to come to this conclusion. Actually, the, the event store uh, originally created by Greg Youngs also have this concept of atomic comet, which can contain multiple events. So we, we're basically talking about the same thing here. Uh, we won't be going into the details, but well, we can easily implement it uh, if, the, if you have an event store backed by a, by a SQL database or a Mongo or a Kafka. Well, we just need to consider what are uh, the boundaries of atomic operations. Um, okay. So uh, this is an example of, uh, of how we would use multiple events. We see that nothing really changes from, from the example before. We just emitted multiple events and we just persisted multiple events. So we can compose event, uh, we can compose commands now. So uh, we should we, we should be good, right? Well, well. well uh, there are some some problem here. Uh, there are some limitation uh, the, for the system that we are using for now. So if I look at this code, okay. If I do many operation, I will have to um, <laughs> to call the handler by hand every time. Uh, I will have to uh, take and accumulate the events manually, and I will have to uh, pass the state from step to step by hand again. So I suppose if we use a more functional approach, we could uh, do this, uh, this kind of stuff uh, in a way better way. Yeah, so uh, basically we have three problems we want to solve. The first is the need to reply intermediate event at every step. The second problem is accumulating intermediate events and in the right order, and also propagating step from uh, propagating state from step to step in a correct way. So let's start with the first one, uh, with replying events automatically. Uh, so again, this is this is the code we just saw. So we see that we have intermediate steps, uh, and we would like to get rid of this. Uh, so one way we could do it. Is, uh, is try to automate somehow. We see a pattern recurring, right? We emit an event, we replay it. We emit, we replay. So we could basically try to, uh, to, ex um, to extract this code into some helper methods. 
Uh, so we need to handle two different cases, creation and updates. And the trick here is really simple. Actually, uh, the only thing we'll do is after emitting the event from the block of code, okay, we'll just associate the resulting state to the event. So basically, if we look, if we look at the type signatures of those, two, of those two functions, we can see that somehow we are, we are starting to lift events into tuples where uh, this, the resulting state is associated to the event. This, this uh, intuition of lifting will be imported later on. So how, how, can, what, how, can, how does it change our code? So this is what we had before, and this is what we get by using such a, such a helper. So uh, this code is, is already uh, much better uh, and much, much more readable. There is only uh, well, one problem, it doesn't compile uh, because of the way for comprehension works uh, in Scala, because we can't destructure uh, the results of the neither. It would uh, require to have a width filter, which doesn't make sense on the neither. But well, for the sake of readability, we'll ignore this error in this talk. Uh, we hope you will forgive us, but we've been throwing exception already, so I get this is, this is uh, not that bad. Okay, so to sum up, uh, here's uh, how our example looks now. Uh, so we've basically resolved the first problem. By using such helpers, we no longer need to replay intermediate events at every step. So the first problem is solved. How about the second one? Okay, so let's talk about uh, accumulating events um, in an automatic way. Um, if you look at this uh, helper, uh, we are previously left uh, a state in uh, uh, an event in a tuple with uh, the event of the new state. Maybe we can do better by not simply having one event, but a sequence of events. So let's wrap it in a, a class. So our source class will, um, will be exactly that, the, the either uh, of the error and the sequence of events on the states. Of course, we can uh, retrieve the events um, and we can um, compose with another source class to which uh, when, we do that, when we do that, we will take the state and pass it to the other one and we will accumulate the events. So, um, so the new signature for the two helpers looks like this. And when we use it, we just remove the, the need of um, um, talking about uh, events. There is no events here, it's a deal um, it's did it for, for us. So the new, if you look at the two code, the first one is the new version and the second one was the version without even sourcing. It's quite similar, it's good. Uh, and of course we can retrieve the events uh, of uh, this kind of code. So okay, the, for the events uh, it's, good. it's done, we can do this. Just. Uh, Small note, if you look at this definition, we have some uh, list of events and we can accumulate events. So for those who don't know it, uh, it was the writer monad. So we just recreate the writer monad, uh, but the original version is way more, is way better uh, in the code. So now let's look at the propagation of the states. Uh, maybe when we have this kind of code, we can do better. Maybe we can try to remove the state by using the same uh, tricks than before, like this. So there is no state, problem solved. So, but maybe this, uh, this kind of trick uh, is not really uh, an answer. If I look at this code, I still can update the state without emitting any events. So in an event sourcing architecture, uh, it would be just uh, breaking everything. So it's not what we want. Okay, so now uh, how can we deal with this problem but in a proper way? Yeah. Before we, uh, we go any further, uh, it will be useful to realize something. But actually, uh, creation and updates are really not the same thing. Because if we think about it, it's only updates 
which are actually monadic uh, and can be composed. Uh, if, we, um, if we append an update to an update, uh, well, well, we can combine them into a composite update. However, we can't combine two creations. It doesn't make sense, right? The only thing we can do with a creation is append uh, some other events, uh, which results in a more uh, in a heavier creation. Okay, so this insight will be uh, very useful to lead us to um, to a better solution. And this uh, this solution will will lead us actually beyond monads. All right. So if we if we look back at um, at our sourcing helpers, uh, uh, what what we did previously was lifting uh, the results of the commands into a monad. Okay. So what if we lifted uh, the commands themselves into structures on which we would have precisely the operator we, we talked about. So how, what, what would it look like? Well, actually, we'd have a source creation class uh, and a source update. The first corresponds just, well, just encapsulates a command, uh, a creation command, which just returns a source, and the other one encapsulates a modification command. Uh, well, Basically, it's very easy to, to define an and then an operator uh, on these classes, which have exactly the semantics we wanted before. Uh, so, in, in, it, uh, for instance, uh, a source creation can be appended with a source update to yield a source creation. So you can see that the implementation is really, really simple. We've, we've just, uh, in a way, uh, delay, uh, delayed the actual flat map uh, which will happen. The same is same can happen with source update. We can also combine another source update to, uh, to, to, to have a final source update which combines uh, both. Okay? Uh, and of course, we can return the events we accumulated this far. Um, you, uh, in the case of update, you'll obviously need to provide some initial state. So we can once again rewrite our example, this time using this syntax. And as you can see, we, we no longer need nor can ma directly manipulate state. Uh, so we no longer risk introducing uh, some inconsist inconsistencies uh, by not emitting uh, the, uh, the underlying events. And again, uh, for those of you who attended the talk this morning, you recognize that this is nothing, uh, nothing different than a classy. So uh, this is just, uh, just a composable function returning a monad uh, uh, so once again, we're not well, we're not discovering new uh, new uh, new type classes. We're just we're just seeing uh, a new use case on how to use them. So let us make a quick recap. Uh, so it looks like we're finally there. We managed to replay previous events. Uh, we managed to accumulate them on the way, so that we don't have to do it manually. And uh, also, uh, we've been propagating state in a, in a safe way. And also. Well, the resulting code really looks the same as the one uh, before we introduced any event sourcing in the first place. So, let us see what, uh, what other benefits uh, we may have from this approach. Okay, so uh, with this kind of approach, you can add a uh, new syntax. Like for instance, um, I could, uh, in this code, uh, it's not a problem, but we can do better because we had to declare uh, at every line uh, that we are using the source helper and source new helper. So maybe we can update our commands to return directly the, uh, the source creation and source update that we plan to use. This makes the code a bit uh, easier to read, but uh, more important, now the work right, the work right method um, is exactly the same as the other command. It has the same signature, and there is no reason to under it in a different way. So we can define the work right uh, command with the others and use it exactly in the same way. So from now, uh, there is uh, no difference between them, and uh, basic command and uh, command composites are the same for us, which is nice. So we can also add more combinators, like I could define a when method, which take a predicate 
and a block, which will return a source update. We'll try the predicates. Um, we will return a new source update, which, um, because it's a function, will uh, receive a state. It will uh, try the predicate and return either the, um, the, the given uh, updates or uh, the equivalent of uh, no operation. Thus, um, an update which uh, generates no events and uh, returns exactly the same state. This way, we can introduce conditional commands in our code. And the important part of this command is the first time it's called, um, we will see uh, if we have to call this command or not. But because we just emit uh, some events or not, uh, every time this event will be replayed exactly the, um, they will be replayed exactly in the same way. So the test is not made every time and uh, it's uh, consistent. Yeah. So what more uh, can we get? Well, an interesting thing uh, is that uh, the sourced monad actually allowed us to compose modification of different instances. So uh, it was, the problem with it was that we could modify the state without emitting any events uh, and we could also just change the resulting type but that can also be an advantage because then we could compose actually, uh, well, even sourcing code which touches multiple instances. So for example, here, we could write uh, a together function uh, which just applies whatever update we give it uh, on, on, on both turtles uh, and accumulate the events for both of them. So obviously there is a trade-off there uh, between consistency and scalability because what it allows you is to make atomic operations on, on multiple instances, but obviously if you want to, to shard to somehow partition your event store, then you'll need to make sure if you decide to do such a thing uh, that the events of uh, the instances you combine uh, need to, to end up in the same, in the same partition of, uh, of, of the store. Uh, another thing, uh, another interesting implication of uh, the source Claysley in turn uh, concerns concurrency. As we've seen, we can now write really declarative programs, right? So, uh, well, all the changes, uh, which describe the changes we, we want to make to some initial state. Uh, so we can run this program with an initial state and actually get all the modifications which result, right? So we've reified all the modifications. Um, well, I, uh, I think you can, you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's really the, the, well, the, it really leads uh, uh, it's really easy to introduce optimistic locking uh, around of it, right? Because we could just uh, hydrate some instances, count the number of events uh, which we've seen, then execute such a program, and conditionally try to insert these events in the store. And if we fail, well, we can just replay, replay uh, this program. So this is, in a sense, similar to, uh, to the IO monads uh, you've seen this morning, except that it doesn't concern, uh, it doesn't reify effects, but it reifies modification of persistent state. And this is actually how we handle concurrency in our systems. Uh, we, we, we build optimistic locking on top of, uh, of such an approach. Okay, so let's sum up. Uh, so we've seen today what, uh, what event sourcing is and what are the, ba the basic building blocks. Uh, we have seen how uh, composability is important and, uh, and a, that the functional approach can, can allow us to, uh, to achieve such, such good composability and also that it can really uh, be done in such a way that even sourcing can really become an implementation detail of your program. You can really write code which, uh, uh, which everybody understands uh, and, and even sourcing is really transparent so it's, uh, it's um, uh, so well, following the uh, the remarks of John this morning is not really, functional programming is here is not a really uh, an end by itself. It's just a mean of achieving well, simplicity. Uh, and in this case, uh, in this case, we've seen how it can also be applied to event sourcing. Well, uh, that's it. We feared we, we won't make it, so we, we, we deleted a lot of slides and uh, finally we, we finished a bit early. But I guess we have more time for questions. Then. Yeah. yeah but, um, usually when 
you see event sourcing people usually apply as a persistence next phase. Uh, I know you didn't cover it probably at all, uh, so you try to put it the, the functionary uh, as well. But how do you see it in the work of active persistence? Can you apply the same principle in the combination of that? Well, the question is, uh, could we apply the same principles uh, in the context of ACA persistence? Uh, well, uh, perhaps you could, uh, but it's true that it's not, it's not exactly the same way. Um, uh, it's not exactly the same philosophy, because in ACA persistence, what you actually source is the messages an actor receives in a way. So it more resembles uh, something which is called command sourcing, right? Rather than even, really even sourcing. It's an event by command, you source an event, not mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, then you can do it, obviously. Uh, so here is well, the assumption is that 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 we reify the modification. So as long as we can do this, and as long as we can uh, somehow persist those modifications in an atomic way, you can apply you can apply this pattern. Are there any are there other questions? Hmm? <laughs> yeah, go on. You can, be, you can do all of this. You can actually just persist events in memory, uh, but obviously, well, you don't really have persistent then, right? Uh, but that's, that's actually what, f uh, for example, uh, frameworks like, like Redux does. Right in the browser, you just you just persist all the state, all, all the modifications, and uh, and you derive the current state of the application based on it. Right? Uh, you can you can use an event store, uh, something uh, inspired by the event store of Greg Young, uh, or you can just roll out your own uh, implementation based on both Kafka or MongoDB or or even an SQL uh, database. So there are a lot of choices, but that's why that's why we we, we didn't want to focus. You know, on on on, uh, on framework choices because uh, these choices may be different in in different contexts. But we believe that these patterns can be applied in all of them as long as, well, those assumptions we we talked about about atomicity apply. <coughs> yeah. Is that um, source mode available, or is it something that is so easy to write? I mean, so compact to write. Well, you've actually seen that it's, it's actually just a writer monad. Right. Uh, so uh, uh, what we usually do is still make a wrapper around of it uh, because to, just to reduce, to reduce the interface so that you, some, some, some developers which are not necessarily familiar with a writer monad can still use it in a perhaps simpler way, but you can just roll out, well, we can just use CATS or, or Scala Z. Uh, basically, well, we prepared, we prepared uh, an implementation of, of all uh, the code we showed you is actually copy pasted from, from this implementation. Uh, so we'll tweet a link to the repository after after the talk. But it, it will be just um, an example of how to use it. Yeah. It is not a library you can use in your yeah, yeah. in your code. But you'll see that it basically is it's a really small piece of code. Okay. So thank you. Thank you everyone.